Wednesday, Saudi Arabia's air defense forces said they have intercepted three ballistic missiles fired at Riyadh and other cities by Yemen's Houthis, who have stepped up attacks recently. According to state media, three rockets were shot down above the capital and the southern cities of Jizan and Najran. The Houthis claim to have targeted the defense ministry in Riyadh and a Saudi Aramco distribution facility in Najran. This marks the fourth time in five months that missiles have flown over Riyadh. Syria's military is preparing for possible airstrikes by the United States and its allies. It has been hiding aircraft, moving its assets, and evacuating potential targets, including the Ministry of Defense and Army headquarters in Damascus. Western nations are promising a response following the suspected chemical weapons attack in the city of Douma. Syrians living in rebel areas welcome any attempt to punish and weaken the Syrian government, but many in the opposition believe nothing will change. They already emptied all the military airports before an attack. This shows that all sides are conspiring against the Syrian people. We are hearing about a possible U.S. strike. We don't believe anything. The last time they hit, nothing happened. They even gave the regime advance notice to remove the planes. If they hit again, it will be limited. It's been several days since U.S. President Donald Trump promised a swift response for what he called an atrocious attack. Last year, his administration carried out a one-off strike against Syria over the use of chemical weapons. Now, the possibilities involve something more forceful. But the presence of Iranian and Russian troops complicates the choice of targets. There is a real risk of direct confrontation with the Russian military. Negotiations on the issue continue between uh, the United States and the Russian Federation, and I think on the, all, all levels, military, political, and governmental level. Uh, I can is, uh, have a conclusion that uh, Russia and America found themselves in the d real deadlock. They're facing a dangerous period uh, that, uh, uh, to begin a, a war uh, clash. The so-called deconfliction hotline that the U.S. and Russian militaries use in Syria to prevent a direct clash is being used. The Kremlin, however, is not saying what is being discussed. We understand that Turkey, a NATO member, is acting as a communication channel between the Western Alliance and Russia. There are behind-the-scenes efforts to try to de-escalate what is being described as a dangerous crisis, a crisis that can lead to a confrontation between the United States and Russia, as well as a showdown between Iran and Israel. Just days after Syria, Russia and Iran accused Israel of attacking an airbase in the Syrian province of Homs, Iran's top advisor to the Supreme Leader, Ali Akbar Walayati, traveled to Damascus. Walayati threatened to expel what he said were occupying U.S. troops in northeast Syria, saying the area east of the Euphrates will be liberated. Iran lost seven of its military personnel in Monday's strike. Not only did it promise a response, its leadership promised to stand by Syria if it's attacked. It will be a limited strike. Uh, it will be against um, military installations, airfields, and all of this, and, uh, and things that uh, can be repaired fairly quickly. I think the American uh, leadership will insist, uh, and, and the European partners, or their European partners, will insist uh, that deterrence has to be re-established. And that means um, that the Syrian regime has to pay a price for that. That price is unlikely to lead to the collapse of the Syrian government, which is further consolidating its control after its victory in the Damascus suburb of eastern Ghouta. France has said if a decision is taken to launch a strike, the government's chemical capabilities will be targeted and not Russian and Iranian assets. The situation is unpredictable, but one thing seems clear significant U.S.-led military intervention to tip the balance of the conflict in favor of the opposition is not on the table. Reuters reports that President Donald Trump warned Russia of imminent military action in Syria over a suspected poison gas attack, declaring that missiles will be coming and lambasting Moscow for standing by Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Trump's tweet was reacting to a warning from Russia that any U.S. missiles fired at Syria over the deadly assault on the rebel enclave of Douma near Damascus would be shot down and the launch sites targeted. His comments raised the prospect of direct conflict over Syria for the first time 
between the two world powers backing opposing sides in the seven-year-old civil war, which has aggravated instability across the Middle East. A Pentagon official told a congressional panel on Thursday due to an increased shipbuilding budget and tempo, as well as extending the service for some ships in the current fleet, the Navy could build its strength to 355 ships over a decade earlier than previously thought. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development and Acquisition, James Gertz, tells the U.S. that the goal of a larger Navy, one of President Donald Trump's signature issues from the campaign trail, could be achieved in the 2030s instead of 2050s. Riot police in France are again out in force today in an operation to clear a protest camp that has left 10 people injured. 2,500 officers have been mobilized to oversee the clearing of the squat in Notre Dame des Landes. The camp was built 10 years ago to block the construction of an airport. Plans to build the airport have now been dropped, but the activists want to maintain their alternative community. Any U.S. military strikes against Syria are likely to come from the Navy, given the threat to aircraft posed by Russian and Syrian defense missiles. Donald Trump has also been liaising with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The United States has military bases in Turkey, and the leaders of the two countries say they have agreed to stay in close touch. But the White House says no firm decision has yet been made. The president has not laid out a timetable and still leaving a number of other options on the table. And we're still considering a number of those and a final decision on that front hasn't been made. The president holds Syria and Russia responsible for this chemical weapons attack. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Wednesday said the situation could only give rise to concern. Speaking at the Kremlin, he expressed hope that common sense would prevail and that international relations would become more stable and predictable. The United Nations Security Council will meet again today to discuss the situation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has expressed his deep concern about the risks of the current impasse, stressing the need to avoid the situation spiraling out of control. Zabid's fortified walls and minarets have stood for more than a thousand years. But the war during the last three years has left its mark. And there's concern continued fighting between the Saudi-led coalition and Houthi rebels could damage the town's archaeological sites beyond repair. Some of the bombing around the city of Zabad and inside the city of Zabad resulted in damage of some building ceilings and wall cracks. And we, as a public body to preserve the historic cities, cannot do anything. Zabed was Yemen's capital between the 13th and 15th centuries. It sits south of today's capital, Sana'a, in an area largely controlled by Houthi rebels. It's also close to the main highway linking the port of Hodeida and the city of Taiz, a crucial supply line where there's been some of the heaviest shelling. The town's heritage was already under threat before the war began in 2014. The UN's cultural agency had placed Zabit on a danger list almost 20 years ago. More than a third of its ancient buildings had been replaced by ones made of concrete. And recent bombing has only made things worse. The bombing of Shijia restaurant affected our houses. They cracked and some walls lent because of the shelling. When Zabit was Yemen's capital 700 years ago, the town's Islamic University was known as the Oxford of the East, a reference to one of the world's famous universities in the UK. Those glory days are gone, but conservationists don't want what's left of the ancient city to disappear completely. Barbara Angopa, Al Jazeera. Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May has summoned the cabinet to a meeting. It's expected she'll ask government ministers to approve Britain's involvement in military action against Syria's chemical weapons infrastructure. It follows reports that May has ordered UK Navy submarines to move within missile range of Syria in readiness for possible strikes. The Prime Minister is not said to have reached a final decision on whether Britain will join any action with the United States and France in response to a suspected chemical attack, but wants to be able to act swiftly. An unceremonious end to what could have been a life-changing trip. 
The first contingent of deporting hundreds of illegal Afghan migrants started on Sunday. Forming an orderly queue in Elzerum airport in northeastern Turkey, these migrants are transited back to their home country, part of a deal between Ankara and Kabul to send all 3,000 Afghan migrants from Erzurum back. One person who has recently arrived back in Afghanistan is Nazruddin. Like most refugees, he was hoping to get a better job to look after his family of 12. One of the reasons that I went to Turkey was because of the daily explosions and suicide bombing in Kabul. One explosion would shut down the businesses nearby for two weeks. We got used to seeing people in the morning, but with no guarantee of seeing them again in the evening. He shows us the websites and Afghan adverts offering Turkish visas and residency cards for $3,000. US However, he took the cheaper and well-trodden path, paying smugglers instead. The standard fee for Afghans is between $1,000 and $1,300. He describes walking through deserts and mountains until crossing the Iranian border with Kurdish smugglers. From there, he was driven in an airless container packed with around 150 people, including whole families, on the journey which had held such high hopes. For him, those were dashed fast. <laughs> Hundreds of young Afghans who try to go to Turkey are committing a big mistake. They don't understand the pain of going through illegal routes, sometimes walking for hours in freezing cold, running or falling, especially on crossing the Iranian border where nearly 90% do it illegally. I've experienced a mountain crossing where I've seen dead bodies of people who died of thirst, so many bodies of Afghans dying there. He is now back in Kabul and is running a restaurant, selling local dishes. His desire for a new life in Turkey is now a jaded memory. Hannah Hoxter, Al Jazeera. All these people ran for their lives. And now patience runs thin. They're waiting for buses to take them to a place to make new homes in this refugee camp in Uganda. Rita Lisa's story is typical. A few days ago, militia attacked her village in Congo. It killed her neighbors with machetes. She fled with her five children. She's pregnant with her six. We saw the fighting had started. Then they started burning houses with people inside. So we went into the forest and hid for three days. Then we decided to run and we came to Uganda. Militias from the Lendu ethnic group have been attacking villages in Rita's province, called Ituri, since January. The UN says that's forced more than 70,000 to flee here to Uganda. Many more are displaced back at home. People have lost their family members and the women are subjected to uh, sexual and gender based violence uh, before and during flight. So they came very traumatized, very tired and some needed very uh, rapid and immediate medical attention. Some people describe the violence as ethnic. Rita says it's not. She says the attackers killed anyone and everyone. She's an ethnic Lendu herself the same as them. Some people here say they don't know why they've been forced from their homes now. Others suspect Congo's government's behind it, trying to stay in power by further postponing the long overdue presidential election. The government denies it. Regardless, people keep arriving here in Uganda. The UN says it needs more resources. Donors threaten to cut funds for refugees in Uganda when government officials were implicated in a corruption scandal earlier this year. But new arrivals still need help. At the moment, a lot of the refugee settlement is a vast expanse of bush. People are given plots, Rita's been given hers here. She's got some plastic sheets and a few simple farm tools. Now she has to build a shelter, that's what she'll be living in for the weeks ahead, and use the tools to start tilling the land and growing some food. And now it's starting to rain. Rita lost her husband when she fled. She and her children now have to wait for somebody to help them put up shelter. It might be safer here, but their struggles aren't over. Malcolm Webb, Al Jazeera, Changwali Refugee Camp, Uganda. Shanghai's dramatic skyline is a symbol of the economic reforms that began in China 40 years ago. But President Xi Jinping chose another part of the country to announce a deepening of those reforms. 
The setting for his speech was the Bao Ao Forum on the island of Hainan, a key diplomatic event and so the perfect setting for an important policy announcement. An announcement that sought to soothe foreign investors now worried about a trade war between China and the United States. This year we will significantly lower the import tariffs for vehicles and also reduce tariffs for some other products. We will work hard to import more products that are competitive and are needed by our people. She wouldn't say how big the cuts would be or when they would happen, but reducing such tariffs are one of President Trump's main demands. And the Chinese leader may have had Trump in mind when he warned against a Cold War mentality and protectionist policies that disadvantage China. We hope that the developed countries will stop imposing limits on normal and reasonable trade of high-tech products and lift the export control of high-tech products to China. Cue the applause from an audience that included world leaders appreciating perhaps the irony that China's Communist Party now sees itself as a pillar for free trade. The president's speech was big on promises, but vague on detail. But his words seemed to be conciliatory, and there appeared to be a message to the United States and others concerned about Chinese trade practices. President Xi promised to protect intellectual property rights, another major area of concern in Washington, a further attempt to present China as a responsible, rules-abiding member of the global trading system. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera, Shanghai. A deal to surrender and leave. Over the last week, thousands of opposition fighters and civilians have left Douma to revolt health areas in northern Syria. About 20,000 people have gone to the northern province of Idlib. For many, the pain of defeat is overwhelming. Those on the opposite side of the war celebrated the evacuations. The last rebel stronghold in eastern Ghouta, now under government control, is covered in rubble. All the entrances are closed. There's mines inside. I can't go in. I've been warned not to go anywhere. You can see the wires and other troubling things. They told me to wait a couple of days until the street is cleared. Evacuations out of Douma are a major victory for Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his ally, Russia. Many of the city's buildings and roads have been destroyed. There have been weeks of intense bombings. The takeover may have been driven by an apparent chemical attack in Douma. About 40 people were killed. Hundreds were treated in hospitals. The Syrian government says it had nothing to do with it, while the Russians deny such an attack even happened. However, Western powers say the Assad regime was to blame, and some, including the U.S., are considering a military response. Under the evacuation deal, Russian military police are now patrolling the streets. A city in transition as the Syrian government keeps gaining ground. Katia Lopez Odoyan, Al Jazeera. Yet another Security Council session on Syria and yet another veto. The 12th exercised by Russia since the conflict began. Twelve members were in favor of a U.S.-led proposal to set up an independent body that would investigate chemical attacks and identify perpetrators. Le vote un de ces clés. This is a moment of truth, the vote that we are faced with today. So I would call upon each of the members of the Security Council, speaking on behalf of France, to take proper stock of what is at stake here and to live up to their responsibilities and to thus vote in favor of the American draft resolution. As the day wore on, the Council continued to splinter. A Russian proposal for an investigative mechanism failed to get the nine votes needed to pass, the U.S. not even needing to veto, and an explanation of how it differed in two ways from the U.S.-led resolution. The key point is our resolution guarantees that any investigations will truly be independent. Russia's resolution gives Russia itself the chance to choose the investigators and then to assess the outcome. There is nothing independent about that. The tone of discussion was no less acerbic than in previous sessions. The Russian ambassador repeating his assertion that the U.S. and its allies were seeking a pretext to take unilateral action against the Syrian government. 
Если вы приняли решение осуществить... If you take the decision to carry out an illegal military adventure, and we do hope that you will come to your senses, well, then you will have to bear responsibility for it yourselves. What you're trying to do is plant a resolution that has been on the shelf for a long time in order to find a pretext. In the course of the session, all members expressed support for the fact-finding mission of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW, which will investigate this past weekend's alleged attack. The key issue, though, while the OPCW is empowered to establish whether or not a chemical attack took place, it has no mandate to identify the state or non-state actors that may have been responsible. A second Russian proposal failed to pass, an apparently non-controversial resolution supporting the work of the OPCW failed to get the necessary votes. Those opposed, pointing out the chemical watchdog was already at work, arguing such a resolution was superfluous. And at the end of this day, so too it appears, was a Security Council. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, United Nations. As tensions increase over the suspected chemical weapons attack in Syria, the Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov has urged against any steps which could lead to an escalation of tensions. U.S. President Donald Trump's latest tweet said it could be very soon or not so soon at all. French President Emmanuel Macron said he has proof that chlorine was used. We are calling on all the responsible members of the international community to think about the possible consequences of such allegations, threats and even more planned actions. No one authorized Western leaders to take the roles of the world's gendarmes and at the same time investigators, prosecutors, judges and executioners. President Vladimir Putin said he hoped common sense will prevail after senior Russian figures have warned that missiles threatening the country's forces will be shot down. President Donald Trump tweeted on Thursday that the U.S. will strike Syria, but he left the timing very vague, stating that it could be very soon or not so soon at all. Trump also said that the U.S. deserves the world's thanks for its actions against ISIS which has lost almost all of its territory. Trump's tweet follows a threat he issued on Wednesday for Russia to get ready because the U.S. would soon strike Syria. Trump made these comments despite Russian claims that such a strike would be met with a Russian counterattack. North Korea is denouncing a new American nuclear strategy that calls for the U.S. to enhance its arsenal of low-yield nuclear weapons. A spokesperson for the North Foreign Ministry's Institute of American Studies says the U.S. strategy is a declaration of war against the world. As part of our defense, we must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Perhaps someday in the future, there will be a magical moment when the countries of the world will get together to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we are not there yet.